either with suture or tackers. So uh, this is a view of such a mesh place. So for the laparoscopic repair, I think knowledge of anatomy of the abdominal wall seems a little bit less important. So it's probably easier and, and more uh, approachable for, for, uh, for a larger group of surgeons to perform that uh, proficiently. The mesh overlap is also very important here, and the mesh is most often placed in tropiotoneal in the traditional ventral hernia repair. When we look at the evidence, what does it say? This is a Cochrane review, and it's uh, a little bit outdated now because they were actually, uh, this is a time before the robot, and laparoscopic would always have been in tropiotoneal mesh, and open would have usually been retromuscular. So what do they find? They find less wound infections, this is one of the basic principles of minimal invasive surgery, reducing wound infections and having a quicker revalidation. But the mesh, cost, the mesh is costing money, the tackle is costing money, and you need penetrating fixation, which is related to postoperative pain. Moreover, you will have an intrapeatineal mesh. Uh, so what does the robot bring to this? The robot has advantages, have an enhanced visualization, it has improved dexterity with the wristed instruments, which is certainly important when you're going to suture the anterior abdominal wall. It has improved surgeon's ergonomics, surgeon independence, you're in control of your own camera, and also the immersive effect of the console uh, is something that I, I, I really favor. Uh, so how would, if we build up evidence during the years, and how could, would a Cochrane review might look like, I think less wound infections that would apply compared to open, quicker revalidation, I think even more probably than uh, standard laparoscopic repair. And you don't need expensive mesh, you don't need penetrating fixation, you don't need intraperitoneal mesh, but you do have the cost of the robotic instruments. And basically to do a robotic repair, number one, you need a robot. Uh, so how are you going to place a larger mesh through for, for repair of ventral hernia? So I can do that intraperitoneal, as we've seen, you can do that preperitoneal, and you can do that retromuscular, which comes with several acronyms. Some people do that onlay as well, endoscopic, but I have no experience with that technique. IPOM, intraperitoneal mesh, you have to use a dedicated mesh to, that increases risk of adhesions, but although these meshes are designed for it, they will create adhesions to a certain extent. And we're getting more and more publications now that intraperitoneal mesh is increasing your risk when you have to get back into the abdomen, for example, for another type of surgery. Uh, clear evidence that an intraperitoneal mesh implant for the remainder of the life of the patient does carry some risk. You can do preperitoneal repair. I will not touch on that because Inan is going to talk about that uh, more extensively. I will talk mainly about the TAROP. There are several different ways to do retromuscular repair. Milos is, is, is a minimal invasive but open technique, and ETAP is a very interesting technique, evolving, uh, was built with laparoscopy. I will not elaborate on that because that will always take too much time. I will talk a little bit about the TAROP approach, which I've adopted uh, with a robotic technique. It's not a new approach. It was described laparoscopically about, uh, in uh, 2013 by a group from uh, Hamburg. Uh, and I recently found out that actually 10 years before, uh, a group from India described, as you read the paper, it's actually completely the same technique. So nothing new under the sun. Uh, the only thing is if you do this laparoscopically, uh, it's very unergonomic. You have to suture you down and tear up on the wall. The ergonomic positions you have to take to perform this uh, surgery is very, very difficult. So that's where the robot comes in. And we've described adopted this technique, we've described it in this short uh, term outcome paper. Uh, and this, is very, this is actually new slides, I have them since last week. Uh, they will be introduced in a new book that's coming out on hernia surgery by Novitsky, uh, actually showing what it is. So go to open the ipsilateral posterior rectus fascia and go to enter the retromuscular plane uh, transabdominally. You create uh, a whole retromuscular plane, you cross the midline, you go there, and then you're going to place your mesh and closure of the posterior rectus fascia. That's basically the technique which we do robotically now. So the approach in our OR, in Maria Medlares, the robot is usually positioned on the right side. 
that just because of the architecture of the OR. If your architecture is un different, you might uh, put the robot on the left side. Uh, but I like to standardize all these things. This is just a picture showing you how low these arms can get, and you're still comfortably suturing the anterior abdominal wall, sitting in the console, uh, stressing the, 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 the ergonomic advantage of the robotic platform. Usually to use uh, three instruments for this, the monopolar curved scissors, a large needle driver, and a pro-grasp forceps. Uh, we approach, I, I, for an umbilical hernia, I use a standard mesh of 15 by 15, a retromuscular mesh, uh, which I draw on the abdomen so that during the operation I can decide how wide the extent of dissection should be. Uh, you know the trocars of the robot, uh, of the XI, they are 8 millimeters, and they have this uh, remote center. It's very important as an abdominal wall, so you want to place this at the level of the abdominal wall because then this will never move when you are going to uh, do your surgery once you're docked and the remote center is positioned well. The stress to the abdominal wall will be less and maybe the pain will be less and maybe also the, uh, the, uh, the risk of, of trocar hernias might be less. This is a short uh, four minute video of, of, of this approach. So the patient is positioned like you see there. We have three trocars in the which is more or less at the anterior axillary line. There's always a compromise. If you go too lateral, you have conflict with the, with the table. If you go too medial, you get difficulties to, to open and close this ipsilateral posterior rectus fascia. So here you see that rectus fascia. It's very important not to go too lateral. Uh, and there is a learning curve to it. There are some pitfalls. So uh, we really want to enter that retromuscular plane. As you know from a brief stop or repair, this is mainly a bloodless plane, you do have the epigastric vessels, but the dissection usually is quite straightforward. Once you see the medial border of the rectus muscle, you push that upwards and you see the junction between the posterior and anterior rectus fascia. You know that medial from that, you will have your linea alba. So it's very important to go behind that junction. Don't go in front or in the subcutaneous plane. You want to go behind that junction and enter the plane behind the uh, linea alba. Usually you see what we call the yellow fat. Uh, the yellow fat should stay with the peritoneum. Also the fat that is uh, often uh, inside the hernia defect will be reduced. And we want to keep that layer, that posterior layer intact, which is the peritoneal layer, uh, because obviously the mesh we're going to place should not be in contact with the, uh, uh, the bowel structures. Now we're crossing over to the other side. So we're opening the posterior rectus fascia on the other side. Also important, don't do that too quickly or too early because otherwise, once again, you're in the subcutaneous plane when you injure the uh, linea alba. We do a dissection and you see me having a needle position there. I like to do the dissection just wide enough to place the mesh, 15 by 15. Of course, it should be wide enough, but don't oversize it too much. Below the umbilicus, there's no diastasis. Above, there might be some diastasis, which then you can close by here. You see me closing the linea alba. Uh, you can also, in some patients, decide to close the defect horizontally. Uh, often we grab part of the hernia sac. That's to create what is the Americans call an inny, which is an inwards inversion of the umbilicus, which is aesthetically more pleasing for the patients. So once the anterior fascia is, is closed, which we do with a pressure low to eight millimeters, we're going to place a mesh. You can use any synthetic mesh, but I, I really like to use the ProGrip mesh, which is a self-fixating mesh, uh, because then I don't have to put additional sutures. If I use, uh, if I, if I use a synthetic non-gripping mesh, then I usually put some sutures either in the midline or, or lateral to keep the mesh in place. But the self-gripping aspect of the, of the mesh is really, really very helpful. Now we're closing the posterior rectus fascia again. Mm. Uh, and this is the part that laparoscopically is extremely difficult. Uh, certainly in patients that don't have a very round belly. So the distance between your trocars and this closure uh, in that case can be very, very short and very, very difficult to perform. It's important to do that closure well because one of the pitfalls is that if you have a dehiscence there, you can have a 
incarceration and contact of the bowel. I think it's very important, certainly if you're going to adopt new techniques that you collect your data. We have uh, all patients are invited to come back after one year. The data are introduced, uh, this is one of these patients, are introduced in the European Registry for Abdominal Wall Hernias. So we have quite extensive uh, multivariable uh, data on all these patients. Uh, so my algorithm at the moment, more or less, is if I have a hernia in M2, M3, M4, which is not too wide, so I can repair it with a mesh of about 15 centimeters, I go retromuscular which will be TAROP or nowadays also sometimes ETAP, but I cannot elaborate on that because time's sake. If it's more lateral or isolated subsiphoidal or suprapubic, I would go for a preperitoneal repair. And there are some instances where I still do intraperitoneal repair. Uh, for example, if the peritoneum is, is uh, destructed during previous surgery or uh, if it's a recurrence after previous retromuscular mesh. Well, but this is now less, more or less the uh, robotic uh, breakdown of, of, of uh, my approach. So too big, uh, you can say too big for laparoscopy. Uh, indeed, we were doing in the beginning when we did laparoscopy, we started doing these big cases as well. You see me that doing that here. But uh, that comes from the period of around 2002 where we were very enthusiastic about laparoscopic hernia repair. If we couldn't close the defect, we would just bridge it. But we found out during the years that this is not optimal. You're not reconstructing the abdominal wall. There was a lot of bulging. Patients were not happy. So more and more surgeons, me included, were turning back to open repair uh, for these bigger hernias. You see uh, single incision surgery, but a big incision, and uh, a big mesh, big dissection, obviously uh, with... Uh, potential risk of wound infection. What's happening with the robotic platform adoption for hernia is that we are now taking back these uh, extensive open repairs uh, to minimal invasive surgery. And I don't have time to elaborate on Robotar. That's a separate lecture of at least half an hour to explain. Uh, but actually, I think do think this is really the incentive, should be the incentive for surgeons uh, treating complex hernias to invest in robotic surgery. And obviously the Americans are uh, somewhat up front of us uh, and they've published already this paper with a significantly reduced length of stay. This is the curve of robotic abdominal wall surgery in the US, probably close to 200,000 cases uh, in 2019. In Maria Madras, we started uh, September 16 uh, with the robotic and me being a hernia surgeon, the robot being available, uh, we started doing and actually September, uh, no, October 16, we did together with Conrad Ballester, who is really one, the pioneer of robotic abdominal wall surgery and Robotar in the US uh, over to proctor me for my first Robotar cases. So this is actually what, what we've done in the last three years. Uh, continue to do groin hernia. As you see, you have all your, your flying hours, your your. You want to spend a lot of time in the console as a robotic surgeon because even every simple operation will make you better. Uh, having access or having surgeries performed at least on a weekly basis, I think, is mandatory, mandatory to become a proficient robotic surgeon. Uh, when we look at the data, as I say, we keep, I keep track of all my data. You see an impressive decrease of open surgery uh, by adopting the robotic platform. Uh, which is the case for primary ventral hernias, like you see there, and also for incisional hernias, uh, basically uh, decreasing the, the, the open approaches. Uh, also, the mesh position really changed. You see here is the retromuscular repair. Uh, you saw I was doing less uh, retromuscular because I went from open to laparoscopy in 2012, 13, 14 for many cases getting away from these small patches. And you see that we increased again retromuscular uh, with adopting the robotic platform in 2016, actually decreasing a lot the intraperitoneal repair. And I really do think that we're treating patients better if we can repair them, uh, avoiding intraperitoneal repair uh, if we can.
So my conclusion slide is, is, is always the same. If you want to, if you're a hernia surgeon and want to do uh, robotic hernia surgery, you have to start working with that platform. Even if you're a, a proficient colorectal surgeon with the robotic platform, take your time and learn anatomy because maybe you're not doing that many hernias and you want to go from simple cases to uh, do more difficult cases. I always advocate to start with groin. Maybe if you have experience with the robot with other pathology, you can move a bit quicker and go to ventral immediately, but you have to get your flying hours and proficiency before you tackle complex things like Robotar or ETAP. Get a proctor for your first cases. The companies are willing to spend and invest in that. Uh, it's a quality uh, quality agreement, I think, with them that uh, when you, they introduce the robotic platform, they want to have them well trained. And keep track of your data. As I said, we have the UHS, but uh, since, uh, since three months, we have a new online hernia database, which is renewed because at the time we created UHS, the robot for hernia that didn't even exist. So this will allow you to, to fill in more of the novel techniques, the retromuscular techniques, and also robotic data in the awesome database, which you can find on the web page you see there. Also, if you want to learn more, uh, we had planned a meeting in the beginning of June at our hospital, uh, which was the third annual meeting. We, are, we have obviously decided to postpone that. We'll see what happens in the coming months. Uh, but put it in your agenda. Maybe the, the places will be limited because of, uh, I will never say social distancing, we have to say physical distancing, uh, that we, we will not be allowed to subscribe, get so many subscriptions that needed. So you might want to check it early if you want to come there. So that was my part of the talk. I don't know if any uh, urgent questions showed up in the chat. Otherwise, because it's, the pathology is a bit the same, so it would be probably sensible to, to take the talk of Enon first uh, before we start uh, question and answers. Stefano? Yes, yes, it's perfect. And uh, compliment for the presentation because it was really interesting, not only for a general surgeon, but also for urologists. And so. It must, must <laughs> have been a good presentation if even you understood it. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. I apologize. Uh, all of a sudden, people got unmuted. Problem is, but that's okay. Uh, you have to unmute also, Dr. Inan. Perfect. Okay, Dr. Inan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, very, very honored to uh, be with you uh, tonight. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Philip. It was a fantastic uh, resume and uh, you flight over the, all the, um, the abdominal wall repair uh, concept. Uh, um, I will focus, I will try to focus on uh, what you gave me as a mission. Uh, just developing the, the RTAPP. Uh, I will share my screen, which is perfect. I'll just So we uh, go up, here we go. So do you have the screen? Everything is okay? Yes. Perfect. So um, these are my uh, small disclosures. Um, uh, I will talk to you about my setting, uh, my uh, journey for ventral hernia repair. Then 
why RTAPP, how I do it, tips and tricks and uh, conclusions. So I'm a visceral surgeon uh, in prior practice since uh, 2008 and uh, my academical base is uh, Geneva University Hospital. Uh, I got acquainted uh, with the robotic platform uh, in 2006. At that time, we were not talking about hernia repair. It was uh, mostly for the urological surgery. Um, and we started uh, with small, difficult cases uh, and developed uh, in time. Um, I'm not a dedicated hernia surgeon. Uh, 30 to 40% of cases, my cases are hernia repairs. Uh, it's mainly uh, oncological surgery, uh, colorectal. So my, my history uh, goes back to 1991 when the first repair that I learned, it was the Velti Erdl, then uh, mesh repair, and then 1997, it was the IPOM. So it was uh, a really uh, something new uh, with uh, minimally invasive surgery. We can do hernias, excellent. <clears throat> In 1999, uh, Shalala surprised us uh, with this concept uh, of uh, closing the, uh, the defect, restoring the anatomy. <clears throat> in 2015, uh, after the first meeting in New York uh, of robotic hernia surgery, a concept which was not uh, even talked about, uh, I discovered that I was not alone in this, uh, on this planet. So I started uh, the, to do the uh, RTAPPs. Uh, then, in two years later, uh, we started to make uh, tar roof technique. Uh, we learned tar, and today it's a mix of uh, ETEP, uh, R, um, R E T A T P, uh, and uh, tar roof. So. The description of the ideal abdominal wall repair for me is the reconstruction of anatomical landmarks first. We have to reconstruct the anatomy. We have to have a low recurrence rate. We have to have low procedural and mesh related complications. We have to let our patients go back to their, their normal life uh, as soon as possible. We have to correct the body image uh, as much as we can, and we have to uh, contain the cost in our days. So why retro uh, pro peritoneal? So because the pre peritoneal space is a real anatomical, uh, anatomical and physiological dissectable space, which was described by Rene Stoppa tens of years before. Uh, the first description uh, description was done for mainly inguinals, uh, mainly. Uh, large recurrent inguinals. They were not talking about the uh, super umbilical uh, midline defects. But I remember in the uh, 1980s, I was passing hours to dissect the proprietorial space in open repair. And we were trying to put the mesh extra peritoneal uh, almost 30 years ago. So, one of the reasons is uh, to use the Preperitoneal space at the beginning for me, it was a sparing of the holy retromuscular space because you never know what will happen to, our, uh, to your passion uh, in 10, uh, 20 years. Uh, if uh, for any other reason there is a, a recurrence of a new hernia, uh, why to uh, disturb this, uh, this space and let it virgin as much as we can? try not to burn bridges. That was the main idea. Uh, of course, it's not uh, suitable for large hernias. It's uh, for two to seven, uh, eight centimeter large hernias, as Philip uh, described. But there are downsides of uh, the RTAPP. So the quality of the peritoneum is not the same with everyone. Sometimes you go and after two, uh, two centimeters of uh, dissection, uh, it's, it's not doable. Uh, the, the quality of the tissue is not, uh, that does not permit you to, to use the space. Um, there are technical challenges and uh, we can learn to dissect as much as possible. Uh, and uh, probably the keyword is the, the 
transfer cells fascia. Uh, I will come back on this. Um, and of course, when you make your first cases, you may have big holes uh, on, the, on the peritoneum that you try to, uh, to repair. And it may be quite uh, um, difficult. Um, and of course you can repair everything, but if it's too weak, uh, um, some days or some weeks uh, later, uh, your bowel may be exposed to uh, the non-protected uh, uh, mesh, uh, which may cause uh, adherences. So for me, at the, at the end of the day, RTAPP is a bonus technique. Yeah? Um, and I think that one should never start uh, an RTAPP without mastering TAROP technique uh, and having discussed and consent uh, these both techniques uh, with, the, with your passion. So um, I think that the robotic platform helps and uh, it's, um, I, I, of course I can always try to do by laparoscopy, but uh, it's quite difficult without a platform because the, the robotic platform gives you the precision of dissection, gives you the ability to reconstruct the anatomical landmarks uh, uh, towards the ceiling. Um, oftentimes, 10 years ago, I was finding myself just uh, bending on the, on the floor, uh, trying to make uh, two passages of uh, sutures. Uh, can take hours, uh, which takes uh, minutes with the robotic platform. Uh, the dexterity to repair the peritoneum that you made holes, of course, uh, it helps. And uh, paradoxically, I think that robotic surgery for TAPP repair or TAROP as well, spare OR time and uh, uh, spare costly disposable material. And we can say that it's a sustainable surgery in in some extent. Um, I think that uh, lap, uh, laparoscopic TAPP for, for abdominal wall repair is definitely the doable, but technically challenging. Uh, should we do RTAPP for all cases? Certainly not. Uh, but I think that uh, today's minimally invasive surgeon should have in the toolbox uh, multiple competencies for me. I use uh, invariably uh, RETEP, uh, TAROP, or RTAPP uh, to the patients that, uh, as, it, uh, as it fits uh, to the needs. There are some um, important things that you have, to, uh, you have to take in consideration when you install your profession. Uh, I use uh, the robot on the right side as Philip uh, does. So I exercise on the left side and I put always my passion very close to the edge of the, um, the operating table. And I put uh, the, the arm uh, pretty low uh, in order to uh, permit the robotic arms to work, especially when I work very close to my trocars. So that's the uh, that's how we install our questions. So this angle is very important. Um, but there is a caveat. Uh, I had some patients who complained about uh, dorsal uh, lumbar pain. I never had one who had uh, persistent pain, but uh, two or three times I had this uh, complaint. Um, what, one thing that I add to all of my patients are the, um, the blocks, uh, local anesthetic blocks. I started with uh, tap block uh, and I moved since two years to a quadratus lumborum block that I uh, do also uh, a posterior sheet uh, rectus block uh, to complete uh, the, uh, uh, the blocks. It takes about uh, five to six minutes or for four blocks. Uh, and it's added to uh, invariably uh, all my patients uh, at the OR. That's my installation. Uh, I start always uh, with a laparoscopy. It's, uh, I start with five millimeter camera, five millimeter trocar visual access. 
uh, I put my trocars on the axillary uh, line, mid axillary line, as lateral as possible, and I changed to my to my first trocar. I changed it for for a robotic one. Uh, then afterwards, we docked the robot. Um, and uh, I would like to show you more technical aspects. Uh, that's a video showing uh, a double um, epigastric and uh, susumbilical and umbilical hernia. So when you start the dissection, uh, I don't have the constraint of uh, going into the uh, rectus sheet. So I start as close to my camera as possible to have a large uh, peritoneal flap. And probably I will come back on it, but the key is not to going on the peritoneum, is sweeping away all the fibers that you have. Uh, where I push always against the abdominal wall and I spare all the fibers, which are the fibers of uh, transverse salus fascia. So I go to the midline. There is a small uh, diastasis with this fashion, but it's not the main concern. This uh, is a four times uh, accelerated video. I will come back on the, the technical details of uh, pre-peritoneal uh, dissection. At the beginning, I was using um, a Maryland uh, bipolar grasper. And nowadays I use the force bipolar um, instrument, which is larger, smoother, and uh, it has the same capacity of grasping with the pro, pro grasp. Uh, and now we start on the other side. It's the mirror dissection. That's the midline. That's the idiomatoma aquata. As Philip said, we can reconstruct in, uh, construct in uh, two different uh, ways. You can reconstruct uh, uh, in the um, craniocaudal uh, fashion as you can do uh, in, on the horizontal fashion. There was a small um, diastasis. I prefer to, to make a reconstruction, which is a vertical one. The problem with uh, the, um, the horizontal reconstruction is that uh, if, uh, if there is uh, a diastasis and in a man, uh, it, can, it can work without, uh, without making a um, deformation of the abdominal wall. Uh, with a lady, most of the time I go for a vertical uh, reconstruction, but we should go probably a little more up and down, not just the whole. So I will just reconstruct the uh, anatomical landmarks. And then we will go to measure that I will not show the, the size of uh, the mesh. Sometimes I use a 15 by 15 mesh on, uh, on a rectangular shape. Sometimes when it's uh, slightly larger, I can use uh, in a di diagonal uh, um, manner. Since I don't have the capacity of uh, gripping meshes on the fascia, because it works on the, the muscle, but not on the fascia. Uh, I need to fix uh, this mesh. It may be uh, my obsession, uh, but I probably am a little bit anxious that uh, the mesh may uh, uh, move 
when I close the preperitoneal uh, space. So I close, uh, I fix the mesh with the 3 O uh, VLOC uh, suture. And that's the uh, closure of the peritoneum. Nothing very fancy. So I was talking about the, uh, the uh, uh, transverse alveolus fascia, which is not described in uh, anatomical uh, textbooks. Uh, uh, I didn't find it, uh, but with uh, the practice and uh, with uh, all the efforts to, to try to understand, we discovered this very tiny uh, transverse alveolus fascia, which is not only on the transverse alveolus muscle, but it goes all the way uh, to the midline and uh, connects with the, uh, with the other side. So if we go to the second video, you will see it's um, umbilical hernia with a very large diastasis that I'll repair at the end. So I go very high uh, to the oxyphoid uh, processes and I start the dissection and literally I push the fascia and I go on the fascia to the white uh, and all the, all the other fibers, I push them away. So, It's not very time consuming once we have uh, the movements, but it may get time consuming if we make holes and we try to close them uh, at the end, especially if, um, if you are not very generous with the, the dissection, it may be a little cumbersome. So we will go down there and then we will go on the other side. So that's the midline. And it's exactly the same thing on the other side. We push away all the fibers that we have in order to have the thickest possible peritoneum at the end. And in some extent, you can go like a tar, uh, very, very far, because that's that's the uh, the plan that uh, you find yourself when you make a tar to go far away. You see the transverse cell fascia is just down there. So we we are coming roughly to the end of the dissection. Here we are a large diastasis and the dissection is over. So I will reconstruct the, the midline and uh, close it in. So tips and tricks, um, it's, a, it's a relatively uh, easy dissection after a certain number of uh, dissection. Uh, the, the important thing is uh, to uh, to fix the mesh. So I show you how I fix the mesh. It's a three zero VLOC. Uh, that's how you have to do without pulling the, the thread too much because if you pull it too much, you will just shrink your mesh on your own. So I will show you as well not to do uh, what you should not do. So I'm sorry, it was uh, a fast one and now it becomes a slow one, but you will see when I will pull my thread, it will just shrink and uh, make a deformation. There we go, this you should not do. And then another problem, it's the hole, how you can close the hole that you had. Um, 
if you try to put uh, one thread after the other one, uh, one passage after the other one, probably you will find yourself with a bigger hole. So what I do is just making a first string suture pretty large without pulling uh, the thread. And once your circle is done progressively, you can, uh, you can pull it and you will see that uh, everything will come together. Even if uh, you have a very tiny peritoneum, you can do this technique. It works pretty well, even with uh, very large holes. Of course, you can uh, dissect a little more peritoneum to have um, a growth factor uh, in order to do this. And here it is. So my experience, uh, I just uh, took some uh, numbers, uh, green and uh, blue are uh, laparoscopic repairs and uh, yellow and uh, orange are a robotic repair. And uh, from 2017, I start to have less and less and uh, now almost uh, nothing on laparoscopy. Uh, inguinal, midline, uh, parastomo, everything goes to, to robotic surgery. And uh, uh, I don't have any IPOM anymore since uh, several years, everything goes uh, um, extra peritoneal. Uh, this the same numbers, uh, different graphic. Uh, these are my uh, um, operating times. We see that uh, um, even if I'm pretty fast in, uh, in laparoscopic surgery, Robotic is uh, once you did uh, 20, 30 uh, cases, it becomes uh, pretty fast as well. Um, almost for every surgery, uh, once the, the technique is uh, systematically um, organized and uh, everything adhe everybody adheres to the technique, everything is ready. Robotic is faster than the laparoscopic surgery, in my experience. This is the my hospital stay. Of course, all my cases are uh, your HS. Now I learned that there is another one. We have to learn uh, this uh, database as well. And my question to, uh, to Philip uh, is two databases are compatible. Can we move to the new one? Uh, in my conclusions, um, I think that the robotic platform is here to stay. There, there will be uh, different uh, platforms in the future, probably. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, that's, a, that's a new surgery. I think that the uh, robotic platform is uh, just a sophisticated MIS tool. Um, and the knowledge in MIS surgery, robot um, um, abdominal wall surgery primes over the technology. Um, RTAPP is an excellent plan A for me, uh, but the other techniques are, uh, as uh, uh, important as they are. And uh, RTAPP is not a perfectly new technique. Uh, it was described 10 years, uh, tens of years before by Rene Stopper. I think that we, did, we discovered nothing really new, just uh, new ways to reach the target. These are my uh, contact informations uh, available. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Inan. Uh, you have a lot of compliments in the in the chat box for your uh, wonderful explanation. And uh, uh, there are two questions. So, uh, what uh, about recurrence of uh, incisional hernia after robotic surgery? I think uh, uh, also Philippe could uh, could reply uh, to this question. So, I if if the uh... The question is about what, what is the recurrence rate of, yes. of uh, incisional hernia after robotics. Uh, well, recurrence rate is determinant of many factors. Uh, whether we will perform better on robotics than, for example, with laparoscopy, I believe yes, but we don't have the data. But I do believe that if you do a proper and a good retromuscular repair, probably I expect the recurrence rate to be lower than with an intraperitoneal uh, IPOM repair. 
but that has to be proven. And there's so many determinants. It's the size of the mesh, the size of overlap. Uh, but uh, okay, we, we don't we don't really know. We have no no good data, long term data, because this is evolving techniques. Uh, on the recurrence rate of incision hernia after robotics. So we cannot claim that by robotic surgery, we have decreased the uh, incidence of recurrences. We have to wait to, to registry data. Uh, probably that will take a few years to really know if we are improving our, uh, our outcomes on recurrences. Okay. Dr. Uh, Hakan Gok. Uh, ask you, uh, Philip, a short comparison, uh, ETEP and uh, R, uh, T -A -R -U -P. So the, the thing is that these two techniques are basically the same. So what you do, you do a retromuscular dissection, you dissect the posterior rectus fascia close to the midline, close the anterior fascia, place a mesh, and you leave open the posterior rectus fascia with a peritoneal bridge. The end result of your surgery is the same. The difference is that by a TARAP, it's a transabdominal approach. So you go in the peritoneum, open posterior rectus fascia, and do your surgery. With the ETAP approach, you will approach the retromuscular plane directly. Uh, I always try to compare it with when you compare groin hernia repairs, a TAPP versus a TEP. It's basically the same comparison. In ETAP, you don't go through the, uh, you try to avoid going transabdominal. So, but in the end of the day, these surgeries are basically uh, having the same end results. And I would expect on the long term to have similar outcomes as well. Okay. A question for uh, uh, Dr. Inan, uh, Dr. Gustavo Seva uh, asks Is there a place for gluing the mesh? Yes, uh, you can uh, you can glue the mesh as well, uh, but it's we don't need really a, a permanent, uh, very strong fixation for the mesh that we put in this space. Uh, that's why you can use a, a, a Vicro or whatsoever resorbable just to hold the mesh in place for several hours during the extirpation and the first. Uh, hours after the surgery, then afterwards it will not move because you make the reconstruction uh, or for the abdominal wall. It's just uh, a mesh holding, helping your reconstruction. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gok, uh, ask again to uh, Dr. Inan, uh, six, eight centimeter defects with, with uh, RTAPP. Uh, Isn't easy to close is it a retromuscular approach to these mid-size hernias better cause this dissection actually a component separation? Oh, there are too many questions in the, in the same one. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I think that we can, we can do whatever we do with the ETEP or TAROP uh, with uh, RTAPP as well. Uh, as uh, large as large the, the, the defect uh, is uh, is more difficult uh, to close it surgically. In my experience, when it goes to seven eight centimeters, I use Botox uh, component separation six weeks before the surgery, almost systematically. And uh, yes, I I still do tars for very large uh, incisional hernia repairs. Um, the last one that I did, it was uh, last week. It was a huge um, parastomal hernia. I went by Tarup and I made a one-sided uh, tar, even though I made uh, a Botox. Um, so it's a mix of uh, different techniques, but we, we, we try to think before um, seeing the hernia on, on front of us, uh, in the robot or by laparoscopy uh, weeks before we think and uh, we do the right things before. Okay, any incidence of uh, hematomas, mesh infections so far in your experience, asked uh, Dr. Radak. So uh, for, for the TARAP approach, 
probably done about, I don't know, 300 cases, more or less. I've seen three patients with uh, erysipelas or infection of the umbilicus. So when you dissect from intraperitoneal or even preperitoneal, you dissect the hernia sac, you have to try to avoid using too much cautery because you might cause uh, burn wounds and ischemia of the, the umbilicus. I've seen that in three cases, it has not led to any mesh infection uh, or a need for mesh removal. Uh, these were treated two with only antibiotics and one with a resection of the necrotic skin and, uh, and antibiotics. Uh, hematoma, uh, yes, there are some. There was one patient in this series that was re had a reoperation after five days for retromuscular hematoma that was rinsed and taken out. Uh, but uh, of course, this it's surgery. We have some complications for, for sure, but not very frequent. Okay. In my experience, I don't have any uh, infection and uh, hematoma. I, I don't drain uh, most of the time uh, my large spaces. Um, and even though it's, it's pretty rare, we may have some hollow uh, hematoma outside, but I never went back to, uh, to drain uh, or never got an infected uh, hematoma whatsoever. Okay. Uh, Lord Bill, uh... And uh, another, so I don't know what is the name of the doctor. Excellent presentations. The poor string trick is an awesome idea. So a lot of compliments. Uh, Rafael Villalobos Mori asks to uh, Professor Moisons, uh, in which cases do you prefer to fixate the preperitoneal retromuscular mesh? So the question here is, do you consider a self-gripping mesh as fixation? I do. So you could say, okay, this, if you use a self-gripping mesh, is this mesh fixed? Yes, I think so. Uh, if you use a non-gripping mesh, uh, like a, a normal synthetic mesh, I like to fix it and usually do it in the midline. So you would like, you roll the mesh up, you fix the mesh line, then you unroll it. So uh, if I use a non-gripping mesh, I would usually fix it with some sutures. You can use glue as well. Of course, that will add some cost. Uh, I think uh, Intuitive should, or the robotic companies, it's not only Intuitive, in the future should try to think about having an instrument that applies glue because uh, I think it might be used to, by, some, uh, by some surgeons like in groin hernia or here in a ventral hernia, just like instead of putting on your, uh, your needle driver, you put in the glue and you, you fix the glue. I see Inan is laughing. Maybe he has a patent on it. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just uh, laughing. Maybe I, I, I just imagined a, a robotic arm uh, spitting glue. <laughs> maybe interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the one thing I can add is that uh, self-gripping mesh, unfortunately, has a maximum size of 30 by 50. So uh, when we stay retromuscular, um, 7.8 centimeters on both sides is enough. But when you go larger, uh, self-gripping mesh, uh, when you uh, add a, a tar and you need a larger mesh, self-gripping mesh, unfortunately, is not an option. Uh, you, you can, all, all, of course, make a patchwork, but I don't, I don't like it. In the future, probably we'll have better ones. Okay, another question for Dr. Rinan. Uh, what would you do if a big gap uh, to the peritoneum happens and you cannot suture it at the end of the RTATP? Unfortunately, this uh, scenario happened to me two or three times, and uh, these were my last uh, RI pumps. Uh, so I changed the mesh and uh, I used the uh, interperitoneal mesh. But with time, um, probably I learned uh, my, the limits of my dissection and uh, my, my limits, uh, my surgical limits, and I switch to, uh, to Tarop uh, very fast uh, uh, if I see that uh, it's not doable. Uh, that's why I stressed in my presentation that uh, 
when we discuss with our patients, we should never sell uh, the, the proprioternal without the uh, plan B of uh, retromuscular in all cases. Okay, Dr. Damascus uh, asks, uh, is managing the overlying skin a limitation of these repairs? Any role for hybrid approaches when cos cosmesis is also an issue? So for, for me, and it goes back also to another question a bit before, when do you do open? Uh, if a patient comes with a hernia uh, and has a significant redundancy of skin, uh, so this is something that you can see after a big weight loss surgery or uh, after uh, multiple pregnancies, uh, patients with a, with a hernia and diastasis. Uh, we tend to do them open, so that is cases that go open for me and we do a, a, a mesh repair if needed uh, during that open surgery. Hybrid repairs, I, I have not done, but I know some surgeons in the US are doing them. Uh, Hybrid would usually, resection of skin usually is, is needed if you have very big hernias. And often uh, I tell the patient that we'll treat your hernia abdominal wall and then we will wait. And often the, the, the skin excess does retract somewhat. And I have not had patients that come back for skin excision or scar excision. Uh, but it can be done, of course, if, if, for example, you would treat somebody and they lose a lot of weight afterwards have a lot of redundant skin, they could go for an abdominoplasty uh, for sure. But I know some people are doing hybrid repairs in the US, uh, claiming similar advantages. But of course, you include once again, the potential risk of wound infection, which you try to avoid by doing it minimal invasive. I totally agree. The same opinion with uh, Philip. Uh, I work with a plastic surgeon. And uh, whenever there is, uh, for me, an indication for um, a tummy tuck, for example, I send them a uh, send passion to uh, my colleague. And uh, vice versa, when he receives a, a passion who has no uh, skin redundancy and uh, diastasis recti, uh, he sends me to me and uh, we do both cases to the uh, robotic or open surgery. Okay. Uh, what is your analgesic protocol when patients are discharged? So for the, the TAROP, patients get uh, paracetamol, one milligram uh, or one gram, I mean, uh, maximum four times a day. They are discharged on that. Uh, they have an escape with, uh, with other medicines, but that's usually not necessary. And I must tell you, one of my standard questions of four weeks follow up is how long did you take pain medication? And very often patients say one, two days uh, has been sufficient. So we're certainly prescribing much less than in the US where they have like the narcotics. Uh, every patient is, is discharged with narcotics prescriptions, which we never done and we never do here. Uh, so basically paracetamol does the trick in the large majority of the patients for me. I don't know, Inan, what you... It's exactly the same thing. The, the, the simple regimen of uh, four grams of paracetamol uh, according to need and uh, ibuprofen three times 400 is uh, most of the time. Uh, one or two days they take and uh, a majority of my patients are bringing back uh, the, the boxes to me. Uh, they say, we don't use it. Uh, can you give this to, to somebody else? Uh, I, in Switzerland, we need a special prescription for opioids. And in 11 years of practice, I don't have this uh, special uh, prescription. So I don't prescribe uh, narcotics. And they never go uh, to uh, back home with the narcotic uh, prescription in our experience. Okay, Dr. Oganov asks, uh, are there differences in hernia repair after flank incision? Well, uh, traditionally lateral hernias are considered more complex to repair because the anatomy is, is certainly uh, a bit different. If it's small hernias, like typically the prostatectomy extraction site trocar holes, 
which we see more and more often, uh, they are small hernias. They can be treated very well with a preperitoneal approach, a bit similar to a spigalian. Uh, if you talk about the large lateral hernias after lumbotomy, that uh, they, they are quite uh, challenging at times and, and uh, not always uh, uh, minimal invasive surgery can be performed for those. So. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Soares asks uh, uh, to Philip, uh, is the port placement in RITAP better been, than... Yeah. Philip, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was... Uh, okay. No, no, no. Talking to the dog. Uh, Dr. Soares asks you, uh, is the port placement in RITAP better than RTAPP to midline hernia repair? So I did, uh, since last year, got proctored on, on robotic ETAP. Uh, if you come from lateral, one of the things is that you have to put your trocars more medial. You, they have to be within the uh, rectus sheet. And that depends a bit on the patient. If they don't have a very wide rectus, dice, uh, rectus muscle, uh, the distance between your, your trocar endings and where you have to work becomes quite short and can be quite tempting. So I've, I've adopted now, uh, when I do ETAP approaches, I, I like to do them from a suprapubic uh, docking approach where we put three trocars suprapubically uh, and that, that suited me better. Uh, okay. I don't know what Enan does. So it's, it's very interesting. We are doing uh, literally always uh, the different things. We, I, I dock on the, on the side and the uh, cranial. Uh, I find myself uh, comfortable, it's especially when we have umbilical hernias and uh, inguinal hernias. I dock uh, cranially and I, I do both uh, or three hernias together. Um, yes, the, the thing which was uh, very important for me, it was this dorsal pain that we had with the hyperextension. Uh, that's the first thing that I've seen, uh, which is very important for the installation of RTAPP or TARUP as well. Uh, you need to be lateral and you have to make a hyperextension. With ETAP, you don't need this. You just leave the passion uh, in a, in a plain position and you go inside. Of course, the, uh, the anatomy may be challenging, um, but once again, I use uh, my um, posterior sheet rectus block injection uh, to facilitate my first trocar, which is a very interesting technique. Okay, a question for both of you. Uh, do your hospital financially benefit from decrease uh, of the length of, the, of stay? So for Belgium, the, obviously, if you're talking about the wide incisional hernias, like the robotars, there, there it's, they will benefit because you will reduce your length of stay from uh, four or five days to about two days. Uh, if we are talking about the, uh, the, the smaller hernias, if you, uh, in Belgium, actually, if you do them at the outpatient, as a day clinic, you get less money than if they stay overnight, one night, which is a bit contradictory. Uh, I know in, in Germany as well, uh, if you reduce your hospital stay, you're actually financially worse off. So it will be dependent on the local structure in, in your country in Europe, and it will be different everywhere. I don't know how it is in Switzerland, in Switzerland, it's a, a little different because we have the DRG system, but for the private practice that I'm, I'm in, uh, it's not a big influence for the moment. It may change, of course. Okay. But the only beneficial so I, in our case is uh, the patient uh, with less pain and uh, more comfort, uh, quick return to activity, etc. etc. Okay. Uh, I think we have to, to move to the next uh, uh, presentation, so I, just, yes? Just one thing, um, yes. there was a question about application from uh, Conrad yes. Palliser. I have I've just uh, seen this. Uh, the question was, are you doing, uh, are you addressing all the 
um, just as these recti cases um, for women, almost everyone. For men with a beer belly, probably I do a, a horizontal closure. What do you do, Philip? Yeah, I, I, uh, it's, it's. You have discussed with the patient. If it's a male patient with a round beer belly and uh, they come for a symptomatic umbilical hernia, I don't treat that diastasis at all. Uh, if a female comes off the pregnancy with a significant diastasis and a hernia, uh, then usually I would go for a complete reinforcement of the uh, abdominal wall. If it's an epigastric hernia, I go more often to plicate the complete diastasis because that's the epigastric hernia is a bit a different disease than an umbilical hernia for sure. So there it's probably beneficial to treat the whole diastasis when you have an epigastric hernia. So at this point, we try to answer uh, quickly also to the last question. Could the tap block perform intraoperatively under the direct vision? I can give an answer <laughs> because this, this one I know. Um, the tap block uh, is best done under US guidance because the, the plane between the transfer cells and the oblicus internus is so tiny that we can always have the, the image or vision that we do a night tap lock uh, intraoperatively, but most of the time we are intramuscular. So uh, even though I did a lot of tap locks, when we improve and we go to the, um, um, to the QL block, uh, quadratus lumborum block, uh, the efficiency of the, uh, the, the block goes beyond 24 hours, most of the time 36 hours. It's, it's a fantastic block. I can advise every, to everyone. Okay. So thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Muizums. Thanks, Dr. Inan. It was a wonderful presentation. And also a neurologist like me uh, was uh, almost able to understand uh, everything. And so uh, it uh, is... Uh, obviously a signal that you did the fantastic work and we can move on with the next uh, presentation and uh, i uh, want to thanks uh, before uh, passing to the next presentation uh, cornil for his uh, who is the general manager of Orsi Academy, uh, who helps uh, uh, a lot in doing uh, this uh, uh, webinar, and uh, Kevin Bo uh, Bowens and also Dil Portman. And uh, uh, for sure, uh, again, thanks to uh, Professor Alex Motri that, who had the idea to uh, begin this wonderful uh, uh, webinars. And uh, now I will give the floor to uh, Vansh Kapila, who is uh, the uh, chairman of uh, the Junior Orsi. Junior Orsi is uh, a really active uh, group of uh, youngsters that works uh, hard inside uh, uh, Orsi. And so I ask Vansh to present the super special guest of uh, uh, this evening. Vansh. Um, hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so I have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Mrs. Anne Waters, who is the captain of the Belgian Cats, the national women basketball team. She's been chosen five times uh, as the best basketball player in Europe, as well as the first Belgian to compete in the WNBA. Uh, Ms. Waters will be giving us a talk about performing as a top athlete uh, and the hurdles she has faced along her journey. I'd gladly pass on the word to Ms. Waters. Uh, I ask Cornel if uh, Anne yeah. has the microphone. Yes. Okay, super. Hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes? perfect. Okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> First of all, thank you for having me. Um, it was quite interesting. Um, I jumped in the com well in the, your webinar. I must admit, I didn't understand much, <laughs> but um, I will talk um, about my own career, about my experiences, um, and maybe I think you guys will see that there are things that we have in common. Um, first of all, every story has its beginning, and here you can see me 
as a little girl, even though little, maybe I was never really little <laughs> because I was one meter <laughs> 95. Um, but I, on that picture, I was really proud. I was the first time I wore a real official uniform, ready to go and perform um, for my first game. Um, never I would have thought that basketball would have uh, led me to travel around the world. Um, I've played in seven different countries on three continents, multiple teams, more than 20 in the past 20 years. So I'm very grateful that I've been able to travel the world, to see, to discover different cultures, to meet also a lot of people with different backgrounds, and all because of playing basketball. Um, soon, of course, I came to understand that it's more than just the game, and that's a little bit what I'm going to talk to you guys about. At the moment, I'm also a mom of three kids, and our kids are getting a little bit older, so they're kind of uh, questioning me about my career, and they were telling, they were asking me, Mom, you tell me that you won a lot of championships, some cups, but where are they? I, they're not in our house. So I thought it was a good moment to, uh, to have a virtual trophy case, as you can say it. And I'm pretty proud of those that I've won. Um, I won four uh, EuroLeague titles. It's kind of, you can compare it with the Champions League of, uh, of our soccer. Um, so that was really big, uh, one Euro Cup, um, a WNBA, which was the competition in the United States. Um, I will explain it a little bit later, but I, I was playing in, in one year, actually two seasons. Uh, the long winter, let's say from October to like April, I was playing in Europe. And then in the summer months, I would go and play in, in uh, the States, where of course, the uh, United States is the country of, of basketball. Um, but for women, it's only a summer competition. So it's kind of when the guys stop, when the NBA stop, the women start. Um, there are also, of course, a lot of domestic um, championships, uh, France, Russia, where I've played most of the time, but also some cups that I've won in Turkey, played one year in Spain. So all good, but there is a big but. I'm actually also proud of this. And those are um, my missed finals, well, or the finals that I've lost. And I'm pretty sure that because I've lost those finals, that I've won more afterwards. Um, there is no success story without a failure. Uh, fail, literally, a first attempt in learning. I think you guys all know how important it is to learn also from mistakes. Even though I think you guys cannot <laughs> make any mistakes, but you guys can practice. But um, in those times, in those lost finals, I think I've learned even maybe more about um, who I was as a player. Of course, I, I became a better player because I was analyzing what could I have done better, what could we have done better as a team to win, um, how to deal with deception because, of course, we were all um, disappointed to do the final. And how can you overcome a, a setback? How can you have then the motivation to go stronger the next season? So all things, I think, that, are, that were very important. And... Um, I think we always talk about the success stories, but we don't always talk about the losses. And I think they are also very important. Um, today, I will, I will talk to you guys a little bit more about, well, I was successful. And, and in many teams, it did happen, winning that championship. And, and what is important, especially in a team sport, um, to achieve those goals together, what could I have done personally um, to, to be part of that success. And I think in English, there is a very, very nice word for it, and it, grit. It's hard to translate in, in any other language, I think, but it, it all goes together, um, the power really of passion, perseverance, um, really um, having that mindset that whatever you want to do, you're going to do it with um, a full heart. You have... Um, every day the motivation for a long time to perform um, you are willing to make sacrifices and they don't even feel like sacrifices anymore. All that um, I think are, are very important characteristics and on that I want to continue to go on. This picture is, uh, says a lot. It's just taken before a game at the World Championship. Of course, we are motivated, we are pumped, we are ready to go. That's easy to be motivated then but it's much harder to be all the time motivated. And um, I think that makes a difference between good players and great players. 
because those are the ones that can do the job or do um, everything that is needed to do also when the spotlights are not on. And I think that's a big one. I think when I was young, um, my parents never pushed me into basketball or even into sports. So I started kind of late playing basketball. And for me, it felt right away like, yeah, I belong here. So it felt good. And um, knowing that I was uh, yeah, a teenager, a really tall <laughs> teenager, a girl, it wasn't always easy. And it was not, um, I was a good student, but um, for my parents, it was always important you have to get good grades and then you can go play basketball. So I kind of had to convince them all the time, like, oh, I want to practice a little bit more. I want to do that. And in the, at the same time, I think maybe that's why I had already um, the perseverance because I always had to convince my parents already to go, oh, please, can I go and, and, and practice a little bit more? Because they never, never pushed me into that. For them, the studies were was most important. But then what happens um, after my high school, um, I think I already could convince my parents, even though there were like some heavy discussions, I went right away to go and play professional. So for them, it was like out of the box, like not knowing what was going on. I didn't have an example in front of me. I didn't even know that women's basketball, we could be funny with it, that it's a professional world. So everything was new. But what I did know was that I was so motivated. I was eager I was eager to learn I was I was there I felt good and it helped me build my confidence and um, I was I was kind of lucky to to uh, also um, right away come in a very professional environment I think at some point in your career you also have to be lucky you have to be sometimes lucky to be at the at the right time on the right spots and I think that happened to me also when I just um, came from high school I had to turn 18. I went to the north of France and there it was like already a top team. Everybody, the whole club was well organized. And that's where I learned what um, work ethic was, what discipline was, what team ethic was. I think for us there as a team, uh, it was always important. No individual is ever more important than the team. And we've worked really, really, really hard. And, and our practices at a lot of times were more competitive than our games. I stayed there six years, and I think it's not, not a coincidence. That's where I kind of won my most titles. We won four times um, French championship. We went four times to the EuroLeague finals, where we won two out of four. And it was like, it was a good experience for me to learn how professional you can, um, you can work. And at the same time, as I was always um, an, an and a kind of an example of a hard worker, I liked it because in that way, it built also my confidence. I had my talent. I have my uh, genetic material about being 1 million 95. It helped, of course. But I also was, uh, was a player that really liked to, yeah, like the hard work, come extra. Uh, even without my coach, he, he didn't ask me to come earlier or whatever. But I, I liked that. And of course, a moment in time and getting a little bit older. And you get to know your body really well. And then it was a kind of an, an, a time for me to accept that I couldn't always be uh, the one um, leading by example by being always there, the, the hardest worker, but I had to become a little bit smarter. And um, of course, the body, and I don't have to tell you guys, uh, after, some high, uh, after some years at the top level, uh, it, it, it's not easy. <laughs> and for me, um, it was a time also kind of difficult to accept that um, physically you're not the same anymore. And slowly um, I'm trying to um, get to the point that I can still be a value to the team, maybe in a different way. And accepting that physically I wasn't maybe as good as him anymore, but in a team sport, of course, you can add so much more. And slowly I started to realize that's also a role that I kind of like and um, maybe not being the top scorer anymore or the top rebounder, but also having a different role in the team has learned me a lot. And I will talk to you guys a little bit more also about that. Um, as you all have to work in teams, I think it's important um, that uh, there is a good um, group dynamic. I think I've been in successful teams and I've been in teams where we had unbelievable individual talent, but we didn't uh, win those finals. It goes back, and I know it's a cliche, but there is no I in team. Um, 
I think it's it's pretty amazing to me that I've I've witnessed um, different cultures, and I think the European culture is, for example, a little bit different than the American culture. Uh, I think, as I told you guys in France, that's where I kind of got my education, uh, my basketball education. It was so important the team, so that's how I've been raised. And for us, it was always uh, winning together. Here uh, with our national team, the Belgian Cats, we've won some. Um, Great games in the recent years um, with a bronze medal at the European Championship in 2017 by really playing together. And to me, those are the most beautiful victories because you can beat another team who has maybe more individual talent, but by working together, by being really a unit, by accepting different roles. Because, of course, in a team, like you guys also know, not everybody is in the spotlight and you also have to be able to accept that. But we found a way um, that we have so much um, enthusiasm in the team that we could um, that it was almost impossible to lose. That even the other team would feel how electric our uh, atmosphere was. So I think it's it's very important um, to have it. And I wrote one time a, t um, a tweet about it. Um, of course, in team sports, you also can have some individual um, accolades. But I think that was never really my goal it was also never important and i've got this question maybe uh, more than a thousand times doesn't it hurt that you've never been sportswoman of the year in belgium and to be honest i still say always the same answer no for me it's like playing together it's uh, as in my team and winning together that's the most important thing i don't have to get any other rewards for that that's sufficient um it goes back to uh in a team there is no iron team, that's for sure, but you also know the, the next one, there is in, in win. I think you don't have to put everything aside, you don't have to put all the time your ego aside um, to be successful in a team. That's why the, you also really have to have great leadership. Um, and leadership can come in different kinds of ways. I think I've learned that also um, during my career that maybe in the beginning, I was much less vocal. I was shy and, and I had to learn how to speak up also, but I, I, I was a leader more um, on, by example. I was working hard, I did everything right on the court, I was listening, I was coachable, I was uh, trying to learn with my eyes, uh, stealing with my eyes, how can I get better? But as I grew also, I think I became a little bit more vocal and knowing that you can push your teammates by encouraging them, by sometimes being hard on them, by being um, uh, true to them, by not only complimenting them, but also sometimes um, holding them accountable and saying, hey, come on, you can do this better. And um, I think those, that kind of leadership is important also to win. Um, I think with our national team, I told it already a little bit, uh, we have that kind of leadership where everybody has different roles. It's not just one person. It's not because I'm the captain that everybody has to listen to me and uh, that everything what I say is, is, is the law. Not at all. I think everybody brings a little bit um, to the team and even to that leadership. Then it doesn't feel like a heavy weight or on one or two players. Uh, of course, the coach, the coaching staff is also important because um, our coach is, of course, the captain of our of our ship, of our boat, and, and he has to um, tell us which way we're going, and then everybody can go in that same direction. So it's, uh, it's always important. And um, what I've noticed in teams where uh, there was a lot of individual talent, but sometimes we didn't accept our roles, and the leadership wasn't great. So um, I've played in Russia, for one of the richest teams. Uh, so they thought they could only buy the biggest names and just be successful. And in a way, of course, I was part of that. I think still, it's, uh, I was disappointed not to win that final. But in a way, it's, it's also good to see that, especially in sports also, if you don't work well together, you can put the best players together. You're not gonna win at the important times. Of course, we won a lot of games because individually we were more talented than the other teams, but at the time where it was really crunch time and where we had to, uh, to win, 
we didn't. And it was a reason because the, the roles were not clear, uh, too many egos, um, there was not a good leadership uh, on the team, there was no trust. Uh, and the, at the same time, we were also a little bit less involved because if I have 20 other top surgeons next to me, then maybe one day I'll say, oh, today he's going to do it. And then the next day you say, I'm a little bit tired today, he will do it. So it wasn't really defined. So that was, I think, our biggest issue uh, to not win those finals in where we were supposed to win them. Um, another point is, of course, resilience. When you talk uh, about athletes, I think it's something that we've learned really, really well, how to deal with any setback, um, how to bounce back. It goes from within, within a game, one action. If it was a great action, you celebrate too long, well, somebody else already scored on you but also in the negative, more in the negative way. If something where you're supposed to score, where it was something easy, you missed, you stay too much with your um, thoughts in that moment, it's gone. So you have to be able to move really, really fast and to have that resilience, that mental toughness, that mental strength to go to the next one and to the next. Even it goes within a game, but it goes also from game to game, even from season to season. It's also how to deal with uncertainties. Um, we all now live in, in Corona times. I think it's something what I've learned also in, in my career. I wasn't always sure where I was going to play uh, in a couple of months, where I was going to live, which apartment, I don't know. So it's, it's um, also be able to, to adapt quickly to a new situation. And a lot of people are struggling with, for example, now this Corona times because there's too much uncertainty. Um, but I think I've learned that over the years that it's okay, we, we will adapt, we will find ways uh, to make it happen. And that is also, I think, a definition of being resilient. Um, of course, it's not always easy, I, I admit that, especially when I was younger in my career, I think um, I could get really, really angry, for example, at refs that made not the right decision in my eyes. But slowly, I think I, I grew into a more mature player and knowing that the wasting energy on those kind of things that you cannot control is just wasteless and, and you don't you don't use your energy well. I think that's something else that, that we as as athletes do pretty good, use our energy really well. And uh, I remember one time we had a very important game, a final, um, and I was playing for a French team just across the border, Villeneuve Dusk, but we had to play in Belgium. So it's kind of special for me. And it was a final played in two games. So it, uh, it matters the difference of points. So the first game we play at our, at our home court in France, and we lost. So I was kind of pissed already that we lost to a Belgian team. Um, and going to the next one, to the next game, it was a couple of days in between. I was so, um, I don't know how to explain it so prepared, I analyzed that game. I, I did not understand how we could, could have lost it, but I knew that I was so well prepared, that I was so focused, that my energy was well, that there was no way that we were gonna lose that game. So it's also when you sometimes hear them, hear them talk about being in a flow, being in your bubble, that was exactly that moment. And it's not always easy to go and find your flow or that bubble, I think it comes together with um, the importance of, of the games, of course, also. Um, I must admit, I don't have that for every game. But for those special games with a lot of pressure on it, too, uh, I think I, I knew how to prepare myself. And um, I think it's something where, where you guys can really relate because uh, you guys cannot take a day off. <laughs> it's not like today you're a little bit tired and you can say, I'll go 80%. It's something you have to be there all the time and all the time at your best because really, literally, lives depend on it. And uh, I think there is a, is a very comparison between us like that you have to deal with that pressure and it's not always easy uh, and you have to be mental tough for that. To, to be able to, to deal with, with everything that comes with it. Um, in the beginning of my, uh, if you know that I talked that I'm a mom and you can see my, my three kids um, on this picture, it wasn't an easy task <laughs> to combine both. 
But at the same time, it gave me so much balance because um, being, I think in our lives, we all have so many different roles. Um, you guys are top surgeons. Um, I'm a, a good basketball player, but I'm also a mom. I'm also a wife. I'm also a sister, a friend, everything else. And it's not always easy to, to find the right balance. Um, I think I've lived as a professional uh, basketball player and it's like very, um, it's actually very selfish. Everything was around me. Yeah, my, there was a schedule around me, the practice. Uh, I, I, I was living um, in other countries for most of the time. I didn't see a lot of my friends or families, even though I enjoyed it. At one point, I needed also more. I needed more, to find more balance in my life. And that's um, where I really decided to become a mom and to carry also um, uh, Vince because it, it, it would give me more energy, more balance. And even though it was, it was a, a difficult decision because I was kind of an athlete that I had to have a lot of sleep and I thought, ooh, with some babies, it's always less sleep and, and it's going to be challenging. But that challenge really turned around to um, giving me more energy. And definitely I slept less hours, that's for sure. But to be able to share it with them and to kind of um, share moments of joy where we win, but actually also the moments of big disappointment. Uh, I think it will, I hope at least, that they will take that with them uh, for the rest of their life. And uh, I think it's a little bit what I've said before, our win is important. And it literally is also what is important now. I've learned um, that combining all those different roles we have in our life from being a top athlete in your, in your, um, or from being at home or from being a friend, it's like trying to live as much as possible in the moment. And it's something that a lot of athletes can do pretty well. We focus well um, on what is important now. When I'm on the court, I know what I have to do. I know what I, I have to work hard. I don't have to do this. Um, this drill because it's gonna make me better. Um, I have to, I know what is expected from me uh, within my team. But then it also is important that you kind of have the highs and the lows also, that you can um, relax. And you, uh, you all know that athletes, we have no guilt feelings laying in our couch, watching a series and rest and recover. <laughs> Maybe um, you guys don't have time, but I think it's still important for everybody when you have a high, high demanding job, sometimes find also the moments where you can relax, where it's time for you to do something else. Is it sports? Is it meditation? Is it watching a movie? But I think you can never always be on the high because then at some point it's going to break. So.